Welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, where stories about the power of focus and resilience are revealed by the people who live those stories. And now, the host of the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, Jack Hopkins. Hello and welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast. I'm your host, Jack Hopkins. You know, in looking at people who have achieved great things in the world or who are currently in the process of achieving great things and are simultaneously making contributions to the others around them or, or the world at large, I've almost always found they've relied very heavily on the power of focus and resilience. And in this podcast, we examine those people. We get them to share their stories. You'll hear the stories of the people who lived those stories. And you'll find out what beliefs, what mental ideas and strategies and skills they applied to the obstacles they ran into to achieve the things that many of you are possibly experiencing the benefits from their work, largely because they were able to overcome and persevere because of their resilience and focus. And today, I am absolutely honored to present to you former GOP lawmaker and former U.S. representative for Virginia's 5th Congressional District, Mr. Denver Rickleman. Now, I've got to tell you, when I read this guy's bio, um, <laughs> it's quite a bio. For example, a former Air Force officer and national security contractor. NSA, baby. Uh, he formed Analytics Warehouse, LLC, in 2007. Riggleman is the only Republican, listen to this, the only Republican to speak on the House of Representatives floor against QAnon. He is a co-sponsor of the 2020 U.S. House Resolution 1154, condemning QAnon and rejecting the conspiracy theories that it promotes. He is also one of the co-authors of the Network Contagion Research Institute report called the QAnon Conspiracy, destroying families, dividing communities, undermining democracy. Interestingly enough, he wrote this report before January 6th. On August 6th, 2021, Riggleman was appointed to serve as a senior staffer to the United States House Select Committee on the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. He's also a best-selling author of the book, The Breach, a fantastic book, by the way. I've read it twice so far. I've highlighted it in two different colors, one with each reading. Get that book, read it. It's outstanding. Riggleman's wife and daughter operate an award-winning Silverback Distillery, which happens to be the only mother-daughter distilling duo in the nation. And you can check that out at sbdistillery.com. Denver and I began communicating about a year ago, and we very quickly found out that we had a lot of things in common. And we just kind of hooked up and said, hey, this is a guy I think I'd enjoy hanging out with. Denver's one of those guys who has crammed 150 years of living into just a little over 50 years. He's done it. He's seen it. And he knows it. You're in for an exciting show. So I present to you now, Mr. Denver Riggleman. All right, Denver Riggleman. Yes, sir. I can't tell you how long I've been waiting for this and, and how anxious I've been to dive in with you face to face, so to speak. We've done a fair amount of communicating through text, uh, but this is 
kind of our our first. It is. It is. I feel like I've known you forever. I, I'm very honored to be on your first podcast. You don't. That is really cool. And uh, and hell, you deserve it, man. You've been out there rocking and rolling and swinging the baseball bat. So it's been been fun to watch it. Well, I, I appreciate that. And and I have to tell you, the number of people when I've announced who my first guest was going to be, I, over and over again, I've I've seen perfect. I couldn't couldn't have picked a better first guest. So th- this is. Uh, uh, my- that's because they drink whiskey, Jack. You know, that's that's because, you know, <laughs> that's because they like bourbon. And they, that's right. Silverback. Yeah, it's probably just a bunch of people who have been by the distillery, bought some bourbon or rye whiskey or something like that, you know. So and I'm flattered. It's fantastic. And again, you know, I've done a lot of podcasts, but when you said you were starting one and you wanted me to be the first guest, you know, I would jump at that. So again, well done. And, and I hope this I hope this explodes for you. I hope it's fantastic. That's cool, man. And I, I do appreciate that. I do. The the one thing when I started looking at your body of work, having you on as a guest, it was obvious to me that you've done a lot of cool stuff that relates to what's going on in our nation right now. You might say, I, I guess it, maybe not that you were born for this, but everything that you did in a chronological order of career-wise and it, it, it's like you knew this was coming and you, you prepared for it. Well, you know, it, it's, um, it's interesting. A lot of people are like, well, Denver, you know, you were in politics. Did you, you know, what does your political career look like? I'm like, what career? <laughs> you know, I, I keep talking, like, I think I was the most, I was the most successful one term congressman in the history of Congress. But, um, and, and, but I do tell people congressman was just my cover because I did, uh, I did 20 years of counterterrorism, uh, before that. And it started kinetically, Jack. Like I started with targeting, of terrorists and equipment and organizations. So that's bombs on foreheads. And then as I got read into more and more classified programs with NSA and Air Force Special Projects and other agencies, uh, when I started getting read into these projects, I started to use data as more of my targeting sort of profile. And then I got read into all these different programs on using, uh, you know, satellite data, telephone data, things like that. So all of a sudden my world expanded. And um, so I went from being really an intel officer that concentrated on using weapons, you know, to go after people, to using data to go after people. And, and you're exactly right. Um, to come in at this point with the sort of the, the mushrooming of conspiracy theories, the whole MAGA movement, me being a Republican and then getting sort of got the boot, you know, as I went to war against my own party. And now after the January 6th committee, I now have my own company doing this again in the artificial intelligence and, and network space. It's just amazing how this has come full circle. So I don't know if I was born to do it, but I certainly, I don't know what, I don't know if it's a uh, fate or somebody is watching out for me or, you know, if it's just luck, um, good or bad. But yeah, it just seems weird that uh, at this point I'm in the exact position where I can use all these skill sets uh, to, to help uh, our fellow man, men and women in this country, I think. Well, I, I think probably an appropriate term to describe is how well you've embraced it. You know, you you realized what tools and skills you had to bring to this. And I, I have to imagine there are a lot of people out there with similar skills who, for whatever reason, uh, would have shied away from it, um, maybe particularly because they were a Republican, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and then this happens, and they're looking at their career. and uh, So, yeah, it, the, the, it's been amazing to me how you just stepped forward in a way that clearly demonstrates, and, and that you did not have to say it's the right thing to do. It, it was clear that you knew. I think it was uh, the right thing. It, it, it is the right thing to do. But you've been leaning pretty far forward too, haven't you, Jack? I mean, if you think about it, and uh, you right. know, I've been watching you. You're not afraid, and 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 you have not been afraid to go after those who are spouting nonsense, regardless of their party affiliation. And I think that takes right. a lot of courage. I, and when you said I'm not afraid. Um, I have been afraid, you know, I, it, because you, you are putting yourself out there and, and what if, and with all the data analytics that I do and, and all the sort of the facts-based insights that I look at, what if that one time you're wrong when you're, you're pushing so far forward because there's so many lies and misconceptions and conspiracy theories that are pushed out there um, by the grifters and the nuttiest of us uh, in our country. 
Um, what if that one time you're wrong that ruins the credibility that you had actually um, sort of baselined your whole reputation on? And I, and because, but you have to fight, right? Because other the the people that you're fighting don't care about the reputation. Uh, they care about winning grift money and putting out as much lies and sort of a bullshit scatter diagram out there, right? So a, a bullshit scatter web uh, that you get caught in. So that's the thing that scares me is, you know, how do I actually make sure that I'm not always telling people I'm 100% correct because you never are. Um, and it's very difficult to be, but at least to give people that, hey, there's a difference between probable and possible. You know, it's it's possible that aliens abducted you last night, but it's not probable, right? And it's it is trying to it's trying to find that balance with people to try to to get them to your way of thinking that facts and data are more important than memes, fantasy, and and people that lie directly to your face in order to profit off of your own ignorance. Right. Well, you you just said something that really stood out to me. You said the people on the other side don't care about their reputation, and. That, that's significant to me for this reason. When you are trying to fight the lies and also manage your own reputation and professionalism against those who don't care about their reputation, it, it puts you at a disadvantage in, in, in a fairly significant way because everything is fair game. To them, and as you know better than anyone, a lie will make its way around the world before the truth gets to the next state in terms of the speed at which things move. So it's it's almost like you know you the 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 thing you are fighting currently they've already moved. Oh three lies ahead. They always do. And people forget, you know, it's funny in the same threads, and I've seen it with you, Jack, you'll have people from the left and the right both hate you in the same post, which is really a credit to you, Jack, way to go. And, you know, for me, it's happened too, but people forget the first real, my first rage um, came from the far left when um, I was winning that election back in 2018. And I was, I was accused of Bigfoot erotica by the far left. I don't know if you remember that, you know, I mean, I was pilloried on Saturday night live. I was number one worldwide on Twitter. I think, you know, people are like, of course, this guy has a kink. He loves Bigfoot porn. And that came from a, a far left opponent. who used my book on disinformation. It was called Bigfoot. It's complicated. A book on disinformation was then actually disinformation was used against me in order to characterize me as a Nazi loving Bigfoot porn addict, which makes me smile now. Um, because <laughs> that sounds, you know, interesting, um, you know, but the far left and the way that they attacked me, which was ludicrous and a lie, it made its way around the world very quickly. But, you know, the far right hit me far worse. You know, the far right, when I officiated the gay wedding in July of 2019 as a Republican, you know, I became a pedophile and tool of the Antichrist. Um, so, yeah, the far left hit me with, you know, Bigfoot porn. But the far right hit me as trying to change the sexual orientation of children. That's a that's a big difference, right? And but I mean, it was awful what happened to me from from a from a leftist idiot. Uh, but the far right are far more violent in their proclivities, you know, when they come after you. And and I'm and I'm okay with that challenge, uh, Jack. But you're right about the lies, right? Lies do make themselves uh, uh, more available to people's frontal lobes than the truth, and uh, and it's something you got to fight all the time. So. This is something I was going to get to later, but we've we've kind of entered that zone already. So I'm going to let's go, buddy. You, I'm ready. Rock and roll. <laughs> how your life has changed mm. in terms of of the attacks and, and the venom uh, that has come. Um, let's let's talk about the venom that has come from the right. As you mentioned, it's it's come from everywhere. But let's talk about like your colleagues and people that you used to work with and uh, how quickly you found yourself uh, on the opposing side in a way that exceeded where you thought you'd ever find yourself. Yeah, it was immediate. Um, listen, the gay wedding, you know, people would, uh, real conversation if you're ready, Jack. So I did the wedding. I'm talking to a, a bunch of people came into my class were at dinner at the Capitol Grill, you know, in the private room, like Denver, we completely support you, but you know, we would lose our election if we came out and support publicly. And, 
you know, so that's the first thing you notice that Harry Truman, I think, was right. If you want a friend in politics, get a dog. You know, I think that was Truman. Uh, if it's not, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll fact check that, you know, fact check that you people out there. Um, but I think that's what he said. And um, I'll tell you, as soon as I went out against QAnon, started about uh, spring of 2020, summer of 2020, I was completely ostracized from the Republican conference. And, you know, especially when I went after Trump specifically for him retweeting conspiracy memes and tropes. Um so I knew at that time, Jack, it, it was immediate. So my own people, right, and, and you could put that in quotes, uh, they, they're they all about their, I would say, it's about survival for themselves in a political way. It's not about what's right or wrong. It's about what polling and fundraising and, you know, your overlord tells you to do, which at the time was Trump. And so it was immediate, Jack. I mean, let me tell you, um, I'm hoping, you know, I've been trying to hit a thousand death threats. I think I'm there, um, you know, one of those things. And had some very bad things happen to me, very bad threats to my family, but um, that, but that just makes me matter. And, and it makes me angry. And, you know, especially when you're former military, you know, as a bouncer when I was younger, I'm old now, Jack, for God's sakes, you know that, but you know, I would rather uh, talk my way out of it than fight my way out of it anymore, but I'll still do it if I got to. And uh, you know, yeah. but you, you get angry and I'm not going to back down from any of these, you know, mouth breathing belly crawlers uh, that want to spew that stuff anonymously behind a digital shield you know, if you, if you really got something to say to me, come say it. But a lot of these people are cowards and you find that out pretty quickly. Yes. But it's the people that don't talk that I worry about, Jack. You know, those are the people that just show up one day that have never said a thing Absolutely. that are the most dangerous. I think I've, I've said something along those lines before that while I don't totally disregard uh, the, you know, a death threat or something that that I get online, those aren't particularly the people I'm concerned about. <laughs> Correct. Uh, I'm more concerned uh, about the guy set up a block and a half away yeah. with his gear rifle and I step out on my front porch and I never know what hit me. Yes. Uh, those are the things, you know, and um, so I, I do know what you mean. I, I don't want you to reveal specifically what, if anything, you've done differently to safeguard your family. But I, I just want to ask, are there changes that you have made well, sure. because of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as you know, I've always, you know, I've always owned weapons and things like that. You know, I was taught to hunt at a very young age and pretty good with a weapon, you know, and, you know, I got a couple of badges in the military for, for marksmanship, but you know, what, what, what happened to me, it got to the point we were even uh, given some advice from law enforcement that we should all, our whole family should be carrying at that point when the QAnon stuff got really bad. So I took my daughters out, um, bought them all weapons. Uh, we started teaching them to shoot in a much better way. My wife is very adept with, with, with handguns and rifles. So really what's interesting, you know, is my wife and I got our concealed carry permits and uh, made sure our daughters were trained. And uh, think about what I'm telling you, by the way. Um, and this is all based on fantasy. This is based on people who believe that, you know, I was a tool of the Antichrist. They call me the general of the sodomite armies, which is pretty original. And um, and then they called my wife the spawn of Satan, and they accused her of laundering money for George Soros through our distilleries. And if, if you oh. think about how ridiculous that is, I know, Jack, you're like, what? I mean, it's it's so insane. These people are so off kilter. I don't know if they stiff glue their whole lives or, you know, were in a really bad accident where they were dropped on their head as a baby. But I think those are the things that we have, right? Or those type of people. And my, my family has suffered because of that. So I wanted to make sure that, that we had the ability at some point, um, just the fact that law enforcement come to me and say, Dan, you know, Congressman, um, what are we going to do here? You know, you're, you're everywhere. And we, you know, a, a line item back bencher doesn't have any protection, Jack. We don't have any, we don't have anything like that. We don't have security following us around. And I don't think people realize how, isolated a congressman can be and um, that their threat vectors are everywhere. And uh, it's very easy to get to a congressional representative who's not in leadership. It sounds like you have uh, the same kind of support at home that I have. My wife and I have had these discussions. Uh, she's very clear of the increased risk from what I do mm -hmm. on social media with the, with the podcast. And at no time has there been any indication from her, oh, then I want you to stop. She realizes the importance of the work that you and I and so many others are doing and that somebody has to do that work. And, um, you, you know, 
I, I left last Wednesday, I think, uh, to go to Columbia, Missouri. And usually my wife and I, we we go someplace, we, we go together. And I hadn't been away from her for a while. I was in the driveway and she stuck her head out the door and she said, do you have your gun? Now, I did, but as I was driving away, I thought, boy, interesting times where I'm leaving for a couple of days and my wife's number one concern is, do you have your... So, yeah, very, uh, very interesting times indeed. So now let's back up a little bit. As a member of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection, at what point, when you were analyzing the data, at what point did you say, holy shit, yeah. this, is, this is bigger, deeper, and more coordinated than I would have ever guessed? So this might surprise people. Um, it, it came well before the January 6th committee. When, uh, when January 6th happened, I got a call that night or early in the morning from Liz Cheney. What people don't realize is I put out there an initial report only three days after January 6th. I think people have forgotten about it, Jack. It was uh, with the Network Contagion Research Institute. We actually posted it and it did quite well. But Liz used that for part of the impeachment process. The holy shit part came when I saw, I believe, and I'm trying to remember the number because now it's hard to believe how long ago this is now, you know, so, you know, three, four years. But when I looked at that first data, we saw that there were seven groups um, attached to white nationalism, uh, white supremacists uh, that were actually connected to all this. And this was well before, you know, the January 6th committee and, and that kind of and that kind of stuff. So I think I was pretty well armed um, intellectually and with data when I went into the January 6th committee. But I will tell you the real um, oh shit moment was even before we identified all the phone numbers and the Mark Meadows texts was reading the content of those texts before we started the identity resolution process. What that means is the forward and reverse looks, lookups on names and numbers to match every single phone number to name and every name to phone number and validate those individuals. So, but just to read the content. And by the way, we sort of knew some of those numbers just by content. We, re, we had to validate those numbers through metadata. But, you know, when I see that Rick Perry is signing his crazy text, Rick Perry, and then he lies about it later on that it wasn't him, People forget he signed his text. I mean, you know, that's pretty, pretty interesting. And, you know, the other thing, too, is the Jenny Thomas text. I was pretty sure that was her number from the beginning, but I had to validate it. But seeing her forward a text um, from Louis Gomert's chief of staff about uh, this being, you know, the Wrights Omaha Beach, pretty huge. And the conspiracy theories all through this. And what people don't know that at the 2319 text, first of all, we don't know if that was all the text because we never got Mark Meadows phone records. But the other thing is, Jack, is this weave of Christian nationalism that was so um, prevalent in those texts and the, and the insanity surrounding the amount of conspiracy theories in, in the three months of texts we saw between Meadows and others. So it was just the oh shit moment was looking at the content of those are those Mark Meadows texts back in, good Lord, December of 21, I would say. So <laughs> speaking of, of the content, was it content that had you not have had the background that that you have and had, had been exposed to the things that you, you've been exposed to both in the military and post-military just a regular factory working guy would there have been like deep deep concerned fear for the average person reading this knowing it was happening between or, or, or was was there more that needed to be put together before? Well, it would have listened. To that. It's a great question, Jack. Really, you know, I've had a background in radicalization um, and data for twenty plus years. I, I probably know more about data than everybody in Congress combined, and that's I'm not even saying that as being arrogant. So I was trained to do, right? Um, sure. So um, I think when I saw it too, is our conspiracy language is its own specific rhythms and its own specific vocabulary. So when I see that Jenny Thomas puts out something about QFSC, uh, the um, um, QFS blockchain, quantum financial services blockchain with watermark ballots that's being pushed by a crazy person, like uh, the guy's last name is Pachanik, if anybody wants to look them up or they can go see these texts themselves, because I think they were released by newspapers. But if you look at those texts, 
they're actually co their code, right? The language is specific to those conspiracy theories, as are the acronyms. So it's just like military language or law enforcement language or certain types of professions that use a lot of acronyms. You know, it, 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 that language is actually a vetting process for these conspiracy theories. So language, if I already knew the language. So once you see those certain types of patterns, I'm like, this is completely batshit. You, you're talking about every level of the Republican Party from the, from the voter all the way to the president and everywhere in between, right? In the legislative, judicial, now think about this, and executive branches in the GOP, all of them were completely consumed with conspiracy theories that were so outlandish, you'd have to have an under 70 IQ to actually believe them. And that's the kind of things that, that really struck me. And, and you see professionals that believe this, people that are doctors or, you know, neurologists or they're psychiatrists or, or whatever, right? Or they're, they're engineers, um, you know, individuals that are in law enforcement, individuals that are in the National Security Agency. I just talked to one. She, there's a person there who actually believes that the videos were faked for January 6th and works in NSA. I mean, that's insane. So those are the type of things that I started to see is that there's that unique language, that unique sort of layering of conspiracy theories is really what pinged me. And I do not think that somebody who just came off the street would say, oh, that's cool. They watermark the ballots to track people. Well, that's come on. You know, it, it, it what they're talking about with watermarking ballots is a secret Trump, you know, led you know, a plan, right, to secretly embed this so the National Guard could arrest people and send the Biden family to Gitmo. Yeah, it's it's insane, but it is it is cool, I would say, not in a great way, but in a weird way, but it is cool to know those those language patterns and what those acronyms mean to conspiracy theorists, and that's probably why I had a little bit more insight. On the House Select Committee, then, with, with the depth of your knowledge in a very specialized area, what challenges, if any, did you have con conveying this to other members of that committee who did not have that background? Uh, I, I'm guessing there was some resistance, at least initially, on some who who just didn't have the basis to to really latch on to it. You know, when you're in that environment as a as a former congressional member, to agree to be a senior staffer, first of all. And I want to tell you, Jack, this, and, and even the people listening, I would never do that again. I would never actually go backwards. Um, and I did that because I thought that's what best for America. I still had my congressional pen, right? I still had access. But what happens is the driver of the investigation or the narrative does not come from the staff. Remember, I was a congressman, never does. It comes from the congressional committee itself. And what happens is, is that nobody knows how call detail records work or the subtleties of that or what a link map looks like or the fact that you need to resource it. And what happened is, is in this communication, this very compressed time frame, we never had the resources to do what we needed to do, number one, um, because they'd rather hire staff members to do work rather than technology, which was ridiculous. And, and I said that, and I think my bluntness was a challenge to a lot of members of the committee. If I had to do it over again, I probably wouldn't be. I still thought of myself as a congressman. Um, that could actually push that narrative, but I wasn't. So it, we got very awkward when I wasn't invited to the congressional only meeting as a former congressman because they wanted to, there was actually some optics issues with me, right? How do you treat Denver Riggleman, right? And I think that was, and then I started to get in arguments with the, with the Democratic and Republican committee members on where we should go in the investigation. I think that's really what led to the tension that I had with the committee was that our team simply knew so much more. And um, and then the then they try to keep us just to the technical portion of it, but we needed to see the narratives to match the data. So now you start to have disconnects. You start to have silos, people working in their own stovepipes and not sharing information because they want credit. Now you have a problem. So as well as the committee did, I think in the future, I don't think Congress is situated well enough to do deep dive technical um, looks. And you're seeing that with the Hunter Biden stuff, which is, listen, the J6 stuff, was done accidentally. Um, if there were any issues, there was nothing purposeful there. I think there was political issues that we had to work through, but I think it was inexperience. I just think they weren't prepared for what I had to tell them based just on data. When you look at the Hunter Biden stuff, right? You have people who are actually using falsified data or data with no provenance. So it's a big difference, but really what it comes down to, Congress is not situated, is not resourced, and doesn't have the experience to do these type of investigations in a way I think that would satisfy um, somebody who's looking at this from a data perspective, to be blunt. Would it be fair, <laughs> would it be fair to say, and, and this may come off as a stupid question, perhaps because it's so obvious, but would it be fair to say that 
the United States, meaning the United States government, was ill-prepared to be able to rapidly organize a committee or even a department to deal with something as serious as this. And let me add to that, uh, as part of that question, or maybe before the question, was there a realization immediately just how serious it was? That is great. You know, there's a realization of people looking at this. If you remember, Jack, and I know you probably, you said this, you know, at the beginning, uh, but to be the only Republican to speak out against QAnon should have been an indicator to me. Um, but it's very difficult for government agencies to react to something this outside the bounds if they're so caught in their own paradigms. Um, let me give you, you know, when you're looking at funding, federal law enforcement funding, huge, DHS, local and state law enforcement. Now you have also 17 intelligence agencies also. Everybody, you think there's a lot of information and data sharing, but there's not. Um, I'm not blaming this on Congress specifically. We had so many intelligence, law enforcement and operational failures especially in the logistics and communications portions before January 6th, it's mind boggling. And what happens with the tribalism, Jack, is people are like, oh, it's all Trump's fault. Yeah, yeah, a lot, of, hell yeah. Trump is an uh, awful human being, an instigator, a charismatic leader who pushed conspiracy theories and fantasy to provoke violence that day, period dot. But the other side is, is that you had a democratic majority in the house that might've been unwilling to see the threat Right. Or you might have Capitol Police who are unwilling to see the threat based on the fact it broke the paradigm where, you know, there's no way there's going to be a bunch of white Trump supporters that are going to attack the Capitol. That's ridiculous. Well, they were self-identifying with the data, Jack. They were saying they were going to do it. So to be blunt, just say, hey, here's the data and here's what it said. And they still say, oh, you know, they, they didn't mean it. <laughs> I, OK. And then then the example I, I use is, OK, you see Proud Boy Oath Keeper chats. What if they were Muslim? How would you react to that threat? So that's the kind of stuff, Jack. I think it's very difficult unless you have, we're so tribal now, we're so left or right, that it's really difficult for somebody who's trying to play it just facts-based or data-based to get in there, Jack. And I think that's the thing that bothers me about what's happening, right? Has it always been like that? Sort of, yeah. I think it's worse now because I think crazy has bloomed based on social and alternate media to a place, alternative media, where it's very hard for us to, to wrestle that pig. I remember one time while studying meta thinking or metacognition, and one of the examples that they used is just kind of a metaphor as to the importance of being able to jump to those higher logical levels and think about previous thoughts and thinking. It said the police never investigate the police. And again, that was, that, that's been 20 years ago, and that was just kind of a, a, a metaphor. But I've thought about this so many times about how we've watched this play out in real time, literally, that when, when you, we go back to uh, Jim Banks, for example, and some of the other, Jim Jordan, I think maybe was the other one that they wanted on, on the committee. Um, how, how do you, and I know I'm asking you to speculate, but how do you think that might have played out had a couple of MAGA guys got on the on the J6 committee? Yeah, and you know, the first people need to remember when I'm saying this, the reason we didn't have a full functioning commission was because the far right blocked it and then blamed the committee for not having enough Republicans after they blocked it, which is, you know, for me pretty savvy political move to get the far right on, but any sane person is going to see for what it was, how, you know, hypocritical and, and bizarre it was. Um, but yeah, to investigate yourself, goodness, Jack, I, I don't, I don't know how far you want me to go on this. Um, but it's very difficult when it comes to the actual internal workings of Congress to point the finger at yourself. If you're talking about the house admin committee, if you're talking about the USCP police board, which we know, I know how that works completely. There, there's so much culpability just with um, incompetence. It's, it's not conspiracy theories. It's not the ridiculousness you see out there. But the fact is, it's very difficult for the government to point the finger at themselves. And, and really, I think that's the other thing that I think that was lacking was how much of a security, intelligence, and operational failure we had on January 6th. And that goes from law enforcement to our political structures. And 
again, I was very vocal about that and, and that wasn't very well received, but you have to have somebody out there who's at least willing to address it. Maybe I'm not a hundred percent right. I didn't have access to all the data, but we certainly should have looked a lot further into the intelligence failures even more than we did. And I, and I think that would really serve the American people well if we revisited it, to be, act, to, to, to be honest with you. You know, I, I've had this question in my mind for about a month now. And if, if you don't want to comment on this, I, I completely understand. Uh -oh. <laughs> but a, a question that I've been asking myself, when, when we look at the level of threats, the increasing level of threats, and um, talking about executing journalists and on and on and on that, that Donald Trump spews at his speaking events, rallies, at what point would we be able to step back and say, you know, this might be something uh, that's a, a UN issue, issue or something that's a CIA issue because it deals with the potential collapse of our government, a threat to our government. Now, before we go into that, I know that that's getting into to tricky ground. And uh, Lord knows that with the uh, effort that's been put in by Merrick Garland not to appear political, um, things like that aren't even on the table. But am I wrong in thinking that we've reached yeah. such a threat level? So the one thing we have done well, I think, in not only our constitutional government governance, but in our authorities and the way that we actually structure law enforcement and the military is separating between foreign and domestic powers. I would hope we would never have the CIA or UN actually involved in any of our affairs uh, internally. Um, CIA is a, is, a, is a foreign element, right? They deal with foreign elements. Um, the right. UN, I don't know if they're actually capable, <laughs> you know, or, you know, obviously don't have the authorities, but the, the, the lack of capability of the UN, I think, is palpable. So I think what we are, we're looking at here is how do we actually train up local, state, and federal law enforcement to recognize, or at least to be honest, about the, what the domestic threat is. And I think it really is a database thing. You know, there's this comment I say all the time, Jack, and it's ones and zeros make the best witness. And for me, you know, to st we still have to keep in line when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to identifying dangerous groups domestically, we still have to keep with those institutions that are authorized to do domestic activities, which is FBI, DHS, right, or ATF, other types of law enforcement. I think if we get into the tricky waters of using CIA, NSA, or any combat element or any intelligence element uh, to look at American citizens or to be part of a solution, I think we run into authorities issues, but I also think we run into really tricky waters on how those people are trained and how they would react to that, you know, as far as any domestic issues. I think that, that would bother me a lot if that were to happen. And uh, I hope it does. I have to say you you answered that exactly the way that I thought you would. And I might add that <laughs> when I would think that through, I come to, to the same conclusion. But that leads me to my next question. Given that we both feel that, okay, that's that's not someplace we'd like to see it go. What needs to happen within the framework that we are trying to solve this? to more adequately be able to address these issues? Because I, I think it's fair to say, without getting into the specifics, nothing like this was ever imagined. Nobody ever contemplated uh, something of this scope. And so now that we've seen something of this mag magnitude, what reorganization, if any, would you look to as, you know, if we did this, and that, boy, it would sure make a lot of this go faster and, and smoother. Yeah, I think I think you saw an attempt at that at the really bad rollout of the DGB, the Digital Governance Board, that sounded like some weird. Do you remember that back in the day? Um, yes. And who they chose and things like that, which really didn't go over very well. Um, where you're trying to look at disinformation sort and how it's affecting you know the American public and how it's affecting people's behaviors. You certainly have private groups doing that. But the issue that you have when you have the First Amendment or you have this type of tribalism 
is what kind of new group would you make? We have so many funded groups already. I'm, you know, I don't even know if anybody's heard about foreign disinformation tracking through the GEC, the Global Engagement Center. You notice know, how many of your listeners know there's a GEC? They're probably going to Google it as soon as I say it. Look up Global Engagement Center. And, and when you're looking at disinformation, you're looking at joint task forces for the FBI, you're looking at you know, domestic terrorism, you're looking at foreign, you know, you look at OFAC, Department of Treasury, right? When they're doing, you know, they're looking at um, terrorist money flows from foreign governments into the United States. There's so many people doing this stuff, Jack, in so many different areas, but they're not really trading information. But identifying domestic terrorism is very difficult. And I don't even know if we have the apparatus to call somebody a domestic terrorist, you know, you know down the line or a domestic terrorist group. And we need to fix that. I think it, it goes again, sadly, it goes through maybe our dumbest institution right now, Congress, right, <laughs> to, to redefine what that means. Um, there's, the, there's the last part of this. I don't want to be too pessimistic, but how far gone are we when we see this type of digital virus or this digital pollution of disinformation that's happening all around us? Jack, I don't, I think maybe we can touch three to 5% of the population, but you, know, you have people out there doing pre-bunking and debunking and I was just in a thing in Georgetown a couple of days ago, Jack. They're like, oh, well, pre-bunking works in these small areas. But, uh, okay, are you going to send pre-bunking videos to the 700,000 people who watch Greg Locke, the MAGA prophet, right, screaming and jumping around on stage that Democrats are possessed by demons? Um, yeah, probably not going to work. So I think the issue that you have is the only way we can do this is, is a better education system, but it's people – like you and me, it's people like, you know, the people that are brave enough to say, hey, this is what's happening. Do we have the ability to stop it? And instead of going back into politics, Jack, that's why I started a company doing the same thing I did was can I identify the bad actors domestically using open source intelligence information? And can I drag them into the sunlight? Even if it's not on the law enforcement side, at least I'm dragging, I'm letting people know. So really my goal is can we affect three to 5% of the population to keep our institutions valid? I don't know if I'm pissing in the wind here, Jack. I don't know um, if it's just completely hopeless, but I think that um, we have the institutions to do it. Is it, do they have the will um, to do it? And do they have the expertise? And have we gone so tribal that truth doesn't matter anyway? And if we're already there, um, you know, maybe we're arranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Right. I, I think you explained that uh, so well. Oh, I, thank you. <laughs> a, a, a shorter uh, a version of that that I think through my own mind is, do I think we have the ability to do this? I, I think we have the ability. But when I ask the question, do I think it's going to happen, meaning we're successful and we come through this, at this point, I, if I'm honest, I really don't know the answer to that. I, 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 I don't know. I don't think anybody does. I don't think you're in. I, you know, everybody's like, Denver, you're a data expert. You did counterterrorism. You were in Congress. You're in the January 6th committee. You're, you're a best-selling author. You know all this. No, I don't. I, You know, I'm pretty good, right, with data. I'm pretty good with identifying bad actors and pretty good with identifying conspiracy theories and uh, people with, you know, I would say nefarious agendas to – rip apart the institution of our government. I mean, look at the four horsemen of the Grifterverse, right? You're looking at Steve Bannon and Alex Jones and, you know, Mike Flynn and Roger Stone, right? Those groups. But, you know, I'm really good at that. But can I, can I, is it possible for a group, even with all the resources we have in the United States, is it possible to change a belief system uh, that God wants Trump to be president and everything else is okay to do something uh, or to do things that, that the, uh, that the means justify the ends no matter what, right? Um, holy crap, Jack. I, I And I'm seeing it everywhere. And and I think there's all, there's a small band of the sane, a coalition of the sane. I think that really need to stick together to see if we can even, you know, maybe we can, maybe we can turn that three to 5%. I don't know, but I think we got to try. That's where I'm at. Regarding our legal system and, and what we've seen, like you just mentioned with, with Bannon, Stone, and others. It, it's interesting because you, you can make two opposing statements a, a, about the state of our legal system. And in my estimation, you you can be right about both of them. For example, I hear people say all the time, our legal system is so fucked up. Look at how long these guys have, have stayed out of jail. And while I totally get that, you can look at the other side and you can say, 
wow, our legal system really works. Because if you've got the money to get good representation, it's very hard for them to put you in jail. And, you know, I, I think the frustration for the average person is they're thinking, but I don't have that kind of money. I couldn't get that kind of representation. So I wouldn't be able to defend myself for more than about a week. I would go to jail. Yes. <laughs> and, and it, you know, and in terms of what's the answer there? I, I don't really think there's an answer uh, other than, um, I guess, make a lot more money and become wealthy so that you, you could be one of them and defend yourself because wow. that's pretty much where it's at. I laugh. The law is not equally applied. I mean, as, as much as I like to right. see the uh, conviction of a lot of the uh, January 6th capital sackers, um, you know, you got to be kidding me that it really the individuals behind it, they're, they're, there's nothing going to happen to them. Not going to happen. Right. And, you know, right. so yeah, your, your line item, your, your worker bees, you know, they got, they got stung up, you know, they got strung up and, put in jail and yeah, they deserve it. They're dumb, you know, great. They broke the law. But what you have though, is you have this and, and thank God for the first amendment. But if you, if like, for instance, Trump is still out there saying this election is stolen. It's almost like, um, you know, innocent because he's insane, right? Not guilty by reason of insanity. And all these people, they rely on it. Hey, we believe this completely. You know, it's like, and this is probably, I'm probably not being nuanced enough. I'm probably doing too black and white, but look about wire fraud. If I send something out, everybody needs to send me money because I think aliens are coming at us. Um, and I send that, that could actually be illegal or legal. It's it's legal if I actually believe it. It's only illegal if they can prove that I knew it was wrong and I did it with intent. And now I have wire fraud because I knew it was a lie. It's hard to prove. Right. So that's the issue that we have. Yeah, our legal system works great going after, you know, those who, do, you know, the awful human beings, you know, at the, at the criminal level and things like that. But when you have something this nuanced or this crazy, when you have an insurrection and you said it, Jack, can we imagine that there'd be an insurrection on the Capitol based on fantasy, um, complete conspiracy theories that weren't true at all uh, because of a president who people believe is God ordained, you would actually go, oh my gosh. But the thing, when you talk about the law, what was legal in Germany before 1933 and after 1933? What was legal in any of these countries? What is the law actually but a reflection of the values of the people that actually make those laws? And you still have to have integrity. You still have to have people that are willing to look at the law, that it is something that is specific, regardless of who you are or what you are. I don't think that's happening. And I think once you lose integrity in our legal institutions, we, that is the slow decline of, you know, a specific nation state. And I think in some respects, we have to fight that every step of the way. That's one of the most sobering thoughts. As bad as you hate to admit it, when you think of a lot of the drivel and garbage that Bannon spews on his War Room podcast, unfortunately, a lot of those strategies have been working. Yeah, and... You know, really targeted, for example, school boards, you know, when you get to local levels of, of government, and they really pieced it together well in terms of how to approach this on all levels simultaneously. It's And I think that's what the, the average person that just kind of reads headlines and maybe the first paragraph of, of an article, I'm not sure that, that most people understand just how complicated that web is in terms of, of that strategy. Very, very effective command and control. And by the way, that multi-flank strategy of taking over local or state government institutions, putting out misinformation, um, you know, trying to manipulate voting laws in states, all that's pretty legal. It's legal. And, and that's what, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, they should be in jail for that. No. No, that that actually means that the because we have democratic institution, we're a public. You have to have people tough enough to push back against that nonsense and vote and have more votes. They're like, oh, five Christian nationalists won the school board vote. Well, get more votes. And yeah, there's some nefarious means, right? Suppression of votes, or maybe there's weird things going on. They're trying to disenfranchise people. I get it. Fight, right? Fight back, right? At that level, with people who are willing to fight back. Um, when you're talking about votes, I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm talking about fighting back through procedures, through laws, through 
to, through the, the, the institutions that we have. Now, if it comes that they become violent, and that's when you hope that the rule of law steps up, right, and protects those individuals who are doing things the right way. But that's what I don't think people understand. There is no moral boundary. There is no limits. There are no limits to what the far right will do. The left believes, and I will say this, independents and some center-right Republicans too, they all believe we're still in the Marcus of Queensberry rules, right? They don't understand that this is a slugfest. This is guerrilla warfare. And the right has no limits because they are driven by a new Christian nationalism message. Trump is their guy, right? This new sort of um, ultra ultra nativist stuff that we're saying, you know, and and we have social media and alternative media to really drive it. You better have a, a response. And, and again, I don't see that integrity coalition, the same response in a lot of these places that we need to see. I agree. As as a former Republican myself, as I'm sure you, mm-hmm. you know from yes. following me on social media, I, I don't approach this like the typical Democrat. I, I'm not concerned about being politically correct or or particularly civil. My question when I post, am I going to be effective for the goal that, that I have? And I, you, you called it out perfect. The, the right has no rules and the left seems to fight as long as they fight within the framework of the rules that they they hold near and dear to their their heart and i think we long ago crossed over the rubicon in terms of whether that's effective any longer or not now to be clear just as you clarified on how we fight you know you're not talking about violence you're talking about attitude which and when i when i talk about fighting that's what i'm talking Absolutely. about I'm, I'm talking about waking up with that fire in your ass pissing vinegar and attacking it attacking the work you do and putting things out with such an attitude that it becomes infectious because if you look at what has happened on the right that's exactly what happened there it became infectious and it spread like a virus down through the ranks. And now there are millions of people, such as a neighbor that I have, who's a pharmacist. And I I think about this guy and I think, here's a guy, I know he can think logically and analytically. He he took and passed higher level chemistry classes, (laughs) but the guy's flying a Trump flag in his front yard. And you you say, how how does this work? The truth is you and I both know how it works, but the pre-educated Denver Riggleman and Jack, Jack Hopkins, we still have that part of our brain that goes, what the hell, man? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we, you know that if you step back, we know the psychological underpinnings and and how this happens with people. But but still on a surface level, you, you scratch your head and you go, my God. How sexy you know, is it though, um, Jack? I mean, you get to be a movie star in your own theatrical release of you're a hero in the battle against good and evil. You know, you're right. you're your own right. movie star, you know. Trump right. is my guy because the Democrats are evil, kid eating blood spilling pedophiles and they're part of the globalist deep state conspiracy against freedom, right? They're trying to destroy Christmas. Obama was born in Kenya, right? 9-11 was an inside job. There's alien abductions, UAPs. They have alien body parts in Area 51, right? The election was stolen by Hugo Chavez. Satan is alive. All this stuff makes you feel part of something bigger than yourself. And I think it's really people that have really lost something in their lives, but also it's sexy. It's not sexy to be sane, man. It's, it's, you know, it's not, we're not sexy guys. We're, we're sane. It's, it's not fun. (laughs) It sucks. In terms of the goal that they had and their agenda, they have better stories. Oh, their stories. And that's, it, that's that's the the uh, sad truth behind so much of this is they've got stories that hook 
people, reel them in, and then they are they are living stories. So th they're not particularly stories that uh, you open it up and there's a beginning and an end. They're stories that invite you to step into them and become one of the characters and live that story perpetually. And I, I see that time and time again. Well, they hit them straight you know, in the amygdala. So, they, they hit them in the amygdala, <laughs> you know, and, and, and right. They hit them and it's emotional stories. In con and, and I've told people this, Jack, inconsistency in these conspiracies is a feature, not a bug. Right. It doesn't right. matter if their stories are consistent, it, it, consistent. It matters how they how they massage and stroke their amygdala. That's it. That it's right. it's an emotional based response because they're in a war for the future of America and God told them to do it. And that's really what you're fighting sometimes. They understand what the casinos understand in a variable reward. If you went to the casino and you pulled the arm and boom, $100, boom, $100, boom, $100. As nutty as it sounds, we know that eventually, man, I've, I've got a job. I've got shit I have to do. I, I've, I've got to go. But the casinos know that when you have a variable reward system where you lose several times in a row and you start to think, you know, fuck it, I'm this is, I, I, I'm done. Ding, 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 ding. You get a reward. Your brain gets flooded with all the good stuff. And you say, I'm going to stay another hour. Mm -hmm. ding, 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 ding. Okay. I, that's when I look at Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Green, the loons, they are like a living one arm bandit. They they will go periods of time where it's kind of flat line and just about the time you think, okay, maybe they're moving, boom, ding, 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 ding. They reward MAGA with, then MAGA says, I'm going to stick around another month. This is actually pretty good. It was starting to bore me, but no. And when you've got that going on, all over the place. It's like you've got separate one-armed bandits scattered here. So there's always one that's giving a reward, yeah, we, even when the others Yeah, aren't. and that reward, uh, it, it, the reward seems to be glue fumes, you know, and, and uh, it keeps killing brain cells, right? It, it's, it's like gas fumes. It smells good, but you smell too much of it. You're going to go cross-eyed and not know where you're at. And I think that's the reward system that they have. Kind of starting to wind things down here. Let's talk a little bit about how you have dealt with the bullshit, uh, the threats, the feeling of being cast out of, of of some form of isolation. What's been your beacon? What's been your North Star? And maybe what are some of the beliefs that you've had going back to the military or even before that have carried you through and are continuing to carry you through. I'm going to be really honest here. And it's going to, people are going to be like, Oh my God, this is nuts. But first of all, my North star has been my wife, Christine, who, uh, you know, we own distilleries. So, you know, she's a master distiller CEO, but has always been there for me, but her integrity, her class, her character, and always saying, Dan, you know, you do what you need to do now. Trust me. She actually has a time. So that's enough. Um, and she does try to hold me back on some of the things I want to do because she is worried about my safety, just like I'm worried about theirs. However, I don't think she's as much worried about my, my physical safety as, as this mental stress that this happened, that this stuff happens, uh, what happens to me. It does physically affect me. And I've had some issues physically, you know, with the kind of stress that you go through. And a lot of people say, Denver, you're unflappable. You never feel stress. Are you kidding me? Of course I do. I'm a human being. Right. Um, right. the other thing too, um, Listen, I haven't been overtly religious for a long time, Jack, a long time, even to the point I'm like, you know, have I gone completely the other way, right? Beyond agnostic and atheism. But I will tell you in the last, last couple of years, if there is something up there that that's bigger than us, that we need to serve, that that's good, that, that helps other people. I feel like that maybe, maybe something has been looking out for me and it's a, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'm very, very honest about this stuff because people are like, well, are you there or not? Well, I, I try to be, but I'm, you know, I'm a facts and data-based guy, right? But 
on the other hand, you know, there's been things happen to me lately that like, maybe this is, maybe my calling wasn't to be in politics. Maybe it was to go back and, and use the technical and operational expertise I have maybe to help with the, this country and people. Cause I hate bullies, Jack, I hate bullies. And we're being bullied on so many levels by really bad people. And I know that's a very simple sentence, bullied by bad people. Eh, gosh, I'm so brilliant. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that it seems my North Star has been a family that I have that I love so much. My grandkids, what are you fighting for? But also I feel like, listen, if we are made in an image of something greater than ourselves and there is no help, we all have been given certain gifts, I think, that we need to, we need to maximize. So let's maximize those gifts for good. I mean, heck, even if there isn't something, and you know, and when we die, we're just warm food and there's crickets crawling out of our eye sockets. At least we can say that we help those people in our future, right? That maybe we'll have a chance to live free and not under the yoke of idiots or not to be bullied, right? Or to destroy it for the type of people they are. I think that is really my North Star. And I only have one life, Jack. I'm gonna be 54 this week, be 54 on Sunday. Um, and you know, I have, I have this, I think one last big run in me to try to make sure that my kids and grandkids live in a better space and to make my wife proud and my friends proud. Have I lost a lot of people? Yeah. A lot of friends, a lot of family gone. But on the other hand, I found a lot of new people like you, Jack, right? That they're out there trying to do the right thing. So me and you are here, right, buddy? And so Absolutely. that's what keeps me going. As I get to talk to somebody like you on a day like today, somebody who's also leaning forward and hoping they can make a difference that have been in the Republican Party like I have and saying maybe truth and facts, maybe going against bad people is what we're meant to do. So that's it. I, I know that's not maybe as profound, but it's really if there's something bigger, I want to be that, that is person. Right. And then and it is anyway, profound. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I find it interesting how similar our thoughts are in this area. Um, I don't think I could put mine together linguistically as elegantly as you did, but mine, I look at it like this, the, the, oh, I'll be 58 next month. I, I wrote that down last night on the calendar and I, my wife was sitting to the next, to the right of me. And I said, my God, I said, I know it in my head, but when I see it on paper, it's, it's <laughs> listen, man, I, I don't feel, do you feel 50? I don't feel 54, right? I don't, no. you know, and, but well, I mean, my joints feel 54 and, you know, and, sure. you know, I'm certainly not going to, you know, be as active as, as I was on prom night, but, I, <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't feel that old, you know? Yeah, I, I feel like a 25-year-old kid trapped in this 58-year-old body. Yeah, no you know, that's kind of no how doubt. it goes. But the older I've, I've gotten, the more of a sense of obligation I have to, to utilize whatever tools I have, my strengths, for something good. It, it, it's that simple. I When I look at the life that I've lived and that I'm enjoying now. And I think, wow, you know, to, like you said, wherever it comes from and however it came to be, to, to be living it and to be enjoying it, there's got to be some form of repayment. And my repayment is, I think, to, to do what every human being should probably do. And that is give back, do what you can to make society a better place. And uh, you, you're going to win some and lose some. That's but life. the fact you're folk trying. Amen, brother. You know, that, Amen. That, I'm with you. I, that is profound. And you know what the sad part is, Jack, and I hate to end it this way, but we think we're doing good. We're good people. We're good men. You know, right. We want, we want to, we want to push that sense of obligation to others to fight coming full circle. The issue is on the other side, you have people who believing people like us are evil because we're against whatever God ordained mission we have on the far right also, or on the far left, if we go against that idiocy that happens at time to time, which I saw you push against. That's the problem we have is that if you're trying to look at things from a perspective of facts and sanity, regardless of how people self identify as Republican, Democrat or other, it puts you in a very narrow space of the population. And so you have to be prepared to be hit from yeah. both sides. 
um, as you're running through those tackling dummies. And I think that's, that's really what I'm just sort of, I've, I've accepted now. And it, it's not fun. Um, but we own distilleries. So there you go. You bet. I got it out. <laughs> hey, on that note, I, I want to uh, tell everybody watching or listening, uh, if you go to SB Distillery, and that's for Silverback Distillery, uh, I love your website. Thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, very informational. It has some great pictures of <laughs> the family. Yeah. It uh, looks like a, a really impressive uh, operation. Thank and you. I might add an award winning yes distillery damn uh, right fairly prestigious uh, awards uh so everybody check that out in closing I, I it was no accident that i chose you as the first guest and and, uh, and let me tell you one of the reasons while we've never met in person at this point you, you were just somebody i i had that sense that when we do meet we're going to like each other. It's going to be we're good. Oh, already like do. Each. We've already met. Already do like each other. Yeah. We, it's all good. Absolutely, right. we would. Right. So this was just, um, it, in my mind, it was just kind of meant to be. I, I think uh, the timeliness of you bringing your tools, your knowledge uh, to this first episode, uh, I'll never be able to thank you enough. I'm honored. But I will make a trip. Uh, to see you sometime in the future and I will uh, tour the facility and uh, maybe sample the, uh, the product. Hey, if that's what we got to do, that's what we got to do, Jack. I mean, you know what, if we, <laughs> if we got to test the product, you know, we will sacrifice and we will do what needs to we be will. done. Just, what, <laughs> we will. We will. just to let you know, but I Remember? just so, so appreciative. Thank you, Jack. And thanks for what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, I, I thank you. And uh, if you are open to it, sometime down the road, we'll do this again. Damn right we will. <laughs> All right, yeah, brother. My, my pleasure. Thank, you, so thank much. you, sir. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Hey, I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed that conversation with Denver Riggleman. I'd like to thank you for watching the Jack Hopkin Show podcast. Please be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. And I hope to see you on the next episode of the Jack Hopkins Show podcast.